Lighthouse Baptist Church. It is a beautiful Wednesday night. I don't know about you, but I am still just overflowing with the messages from Sunday and what the Lord has done for us. Will you stand and worship with us tonight? I stand amazed. Amazed in the presence of Jesus the singing church. Tonight's passage comes from the book of Colossians chapter 1 verses 12 through 17 and verse 27 where it says giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins who is the image of the invisible God firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Continue singing with us because he lives. Sweet. 
but greater still, the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he God. Let's give the Lord a hand for His resurrection. We still get to celebrate. Amen. And uh, we're so glad to have you tonight at Lighthouse, and we're looking forward to a great night tonight, and uh, God's been so good to us. Praise the Lord. Sunday we had five who came forward and are, are in our rooms and trusted in Christ as their Savior, five adults, and we had 975 people here Sunday, so uh, that was a lot of people. <laughs> so praise God for a great day. And and I want to thank everybody who helped serve in different areas, who prayed, invited, and uh, thank you for going to three different services, because if you weren't in each one, we've been, we've been in trouble, and so uh, it's a good problem, but it's, uh, it's a blessing. So if you're a guest tonight, thank you for being here after the service. You're welcome to stop by our guest welcome center. We have a gift for you, and so uh, we're going to open up in a word of prayer as we begin tonight. I ask Brother Braden if you could open us in a word of prayer. And you may be seated. If I could have maybe uh, five or six people help me pass out our monthly report. Uh, anybody that's close by would be helpful. You, you want to kind of divvy those out there. If you have a prayer request tonight, uh, if you just raise your hand and we got some guys that are come around and they'll get that prayer request for you. And so if you wouldn't mind just raising your hand and uh, we'll get you a green prayer card and you can fill that green prayer card out and we will gather those at the end of service and pray for those. If you have a private prayer request, you would just like the church staff to pray for, you can put private at the top of there, and uh, we won't announce that prayer request, but we'll pray for that. So uh, you can do that. Also, if you're watching online, want to join those uh, who are uh, on the live stream, and you can also uh, put forth a prayer request inside the chat there, and we'll make sure we uh, note that to pray for that as well. Raise your hand if you don't have a uh, report, one of the March reports. I'll go over March report. So we got some down front that still need, need some of these. Well, who liked that snow? Was that Saturday that it snowed? Was that, sat was, was that Monday? I don't even remember my days. Yeah, Monday. I told my wife, I said, it's going to snow 
it's going to snow later this morning. She's like, no. I was like, no. She's so used to me being serious all the time. No, <laughs> no she knows her husband. And uh, uh, it was snowing like middle of winter. Uh, yeah, there was, uh, thankfully, it's going to be 80 degrees this weekend, right? That's, that's Ohio, buddy. Yeah, get, don't put your coat away yet, you know. It may get 10 inches next week. Who knows, you know. Uh, nothing's on the horizon, so don't be worried. Anybody else need one of the uh, monthly reports? Just raise your hand down front here. Uh, we still need some monthly reports down front here. We have maybe about running out of them, so print some more of those. All right, well, let's take a, take a moment and just run through the March, March report there. Uh, praise the Lord, we had 19 salvation decisions. Folks calling out to Christ for salvation. study that'll, I know it's helped my own soul and chewing on some thoughts in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to read verse 9 down to 
verse number 15. Um, it says in verse 9, for we are laborers together with God. And that's a tremendous statement. He's talking about how we're, we are, we are though God, God, you know, we, some plant, some water, but God gives the increase. And he's talking about how we are laborers. We're like God is a, we're God's husbandry. We're God's farmers. We're his field. We're going out there and working in the fields. We're his husbandry. But we're also, it says, his building. And we labor with God in the fields seeing souls come to Christ, God chose to use people to proclaim the gospel and, and, and to reach souls for Christ. And then verse 10 says, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Father, again, we're thankful, so grateful for your mercy we thank you so much for the souls who were saved this week and who cried out for salvation. We thank you that mercy and grace is, is so abundant upon us. Thank you for the story of the thief on the cross that we can look to and find uh, a story of redemption. That even while you're dying, you're saving. And, and you're focused on uh, pouring out salvation upon a lost soul. And God, I pray tonight as we study your word that our hearts would be soft, that we would be pliable. God, that you would mold and fashion us as a potter does the clay. And I pray that you would help us to be faithful. Give us a mind of, uh, for eternity. Help us to set our focus on eternal things and not temporary things. How easy we can be distracted. And so remove those distractions now. Give us a, a, close, a close mind to the things of Christ. That we would be closed off to the things of the world and open to the things of you. And just, just, just receiving that truth tonight, Lord. We ask your blessing now in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. You can be seated tonight. Kind of walking back through chapter 3 once again, Paul uses three different illustrations of the church to help us understand our responsibilities. The first three or four verses, he talks about the family structure, and he talks about uh, we're born into the family of God, we're babes in Christ, but we can't stay as babes in Christ, we got to mature uh, in our faith. Then he talks about how we are fields, and we are to be productive, so he talks about being being a family of God, that we're to be mature. Secondly, a field of God and be productive. And then thirdly, he talks about us being a building for God and we need to be uh, those who have good quality. So really the first essence of verse 1 through 4 is talking about maturity. Verse 5 through the first part of verse 9 is talking about productivity. Seeing people saved, seeing people coming to Christ, planting, watering, God bringing the increase. And then, then the last is really talking about quality and and I think this message is so helpful because it deals with perspective. Perspective. And so often we can be very short-sighted. We can, we can live in the here and now. We don't really ponder the eternal enough, I think. One man said, short is life, fleeting is time, quick is death, sure is judgment, and long is eternity. I would ask a question. Are you living your current life with eternity in view? Are you living with real purpose and focus that... No matter what happens uh, in the short side, you're really focused on the long, the eternal, uh, that you're looking at what will happen in a hundred years from now. There's only two things that are eternal in the earth. Only two things. People and the Word of God. There's only two things that will last forever on this earth. People and the Word of God. Everything else will be dissolved. Knowing that, should that change how we begin to, how we live our lives? Sometimes I've heard people say through the years, you know, I just can't stand being around people. I'm like, well, yeah, you better get used to it. <laughs> um, and, and, and that's a terrible attitude, especially for a Christian, right? And so uh, 2 Peter 3.11 says, Seeing then all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in all holy conversation and co godliness? Seeing that everything will be dissolved, we need to really focus on the eternal. And Paul goes here into a discussion of the believer's future judgment and, and how we should live in light of that judgment that's coming. And so 
Uh, first of all, he tells us here to build as good stewards. Verse 9, he says this, Ye are God's building. At the end of verse number 9, he says, Ye are God's building. So he transitions here in verse 9 from an agricultural illustration to an illustration of construction. The church doesn't belong to people or the pastor or to a group of leaders in the church. Now, sometimes people say, you know, I really enjoy going to your church, but it's like, well, it's not my church, it's the Lord's church, and, and it's the people's church, and, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's people that make up the church, but it's the Lord's church, and we're just part of that church body. But the church itself belongs to God, it's God's church. When I was in high school, uh, I remember there was a mason that I worked for, and, uh, you know, it does, does bother me when I know what I made working like a slave for a mason uh, and seeing some of these jobs that kids are making now at like Walmart and, and uh, down at some different little restaurants and stuff. It's like, man, if I could have made that kind of money, you know, when I was dying, you know, some of y'all are laughing because you're saying, preacher, whatever you made is so much more than what we made back in our day. I guess it's all relative, though, but... But uh, I remember working for a mason, and we were doing brick work. Uh, if you ever seen the trucks, uh, R&L Trucking, uh, Robbie Roberts and Larry Roberts, they own R&L Trucking, and uh, big, big business it came out of Wilmington. Uh, but we were, we were doing the brick work on his house, and, <laughs> and I remember uh, this house was just incredible. I mean, it, it had a 10-car garage, it had a mini theater, it had an indoor swimming pool, a bowling alley in it. I mean, this thing was massive. It was a campus. It had a helicopter pad in the front. And I remember when we went on the job side and, you know, we're doing all the brickwork. And, and um, now I'm a, I'm a teenager. Like, I'm not doing the brickwork. I'm doing what you call hod caring. What's that mean? It means you like do whatever they tell you to do. You know, you're bringing brick, you're, you're, you're mixing mortar. Uh, you, you, you ever seen the Ten Commandments? I'm like the guy in those pits, you know, stomping the mud, you know. No, it wasn't quite that bad, almost. But, uh, but that got me ready for football, I think. And, um, but I remember before we started the project, the boss got everybody together and, uh, and he had a conversation with us, and he said, listen, he said, We're, this, is, this is a huge project, this is a special project, and he says, uh, you need to be very careful and, 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 and detailed about the work that we do and all the things that we're setting up, cleaning up the job site, making things sharp, just really went over a, a uh, really good, strong conversation with all the work crew that were there, a lot of them were my brothers and, and different ones, but um, uh, because of who we were working for. It wasn't we were working for Larry, we were work, Larry Grisham, we were working for this, uh, this, the boss of the house, you know, and he was there often and, and, uh, and, and wanted to make it good. And, and so Paul comes here and he says in verse number nine, you're God's building. You're God's building. This, this, is, a, this is a big work. It's true that the believer is the temple of God, but he is speaking here about the church specifically, and it's of utmost importance that we understand our work in the church, what we do, how we do it, our attitude, and, and how we perform the work that, that we do in service in the church. And, and, and when you ask the question, how, uh, how important is a new house for somebody when they're building? And it's really all that's on their mind. You know, they're going to work, but they're thinking about their house getting built. They want to come home and see the production and how things are going on and and, and, and how things are moving forward. And, uh, and, and you ask the question, how much does the church mean to Jesus? And you read Acts 20, 28, and it tells us that he purchased it with his own blood. And, and you realize how valuable and, and, and precious the church is. So we have to build as, with a mindset of being good stewards. And secondly, we need to build with the right foundation. He says in verse number 10 of chapter 3, according to the grace of God, which is Given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, uh, than that is laid, which is the apostle Peter. Is that what it says? Yes. That's what some people think it says. But it doesn't say that, does it? It says, which is Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus is the foundation. That's why when Paul came to Corinth, he determined to preach Christ and Him crucified. And in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 and 2, he says, I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declared unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I'm going to tell you something. People don't preach Christ crucified anymore. 
Very often do, do you find churches that want to talk about the cross of Christ. They want to talk about the blessings that God has for you. How, how you can be blessed and how God just wants to, and you can have your best life if you do this, and, and you can be empowered, and you can be strong and courageous and do all these wonderful things, and, and really a man-centered gospel. Really a way that, that, that meets the felt needs of man. And, and you come to Paul and he's like, I, de- I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He, he, he brought them foolishness. It's, it's literally, if you go back to chapter number 1, he says, for, for the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us that are saved, it's the power of God. The word foolishness there, literally, literally in the Greek is moros. It's where we get the word moron. I preach Christ crucified, which is to the world moronic. It's, it's, they think it's moronic. This is so foolish to them. They, they think this is the silliest, most irrational, and, and, and so you, you don't want to have a church that the world looks at and says, man, they just really make a lot of sense. Where, the world, where, where we entice the world to come. If you can get a bunch of lost people to come to your church and feel really comfortable and be like, you know what, this is really, you know, I'm not saved, but you know, I can really, they should be hit in the soul with a, with a sword that says you come to the cross and either you die upon it and receive Christ or you reject it. There is no third option. Christ makes you make a decision. If you don't believe that, just read the Bible, right? I mean, they, they either crucified him or they worshipped him. There was no third option. C.S. Lewis was right. Either you bow down and worship him or you, you crucify him. There is no third option. And, and I think so often this soft... I had, had somebody tell me, they said, uh, how can I get a hold of you? Like, is there a way I can send like a letter of complaint? I said... Uh, I said, well, I, I, I said, uh, I'll send that to the complaint department, the trash can, if you want to send that letter. But no, they said, well, you know, uh, and they were teasing me, you know, you're talking about blonde haired and, 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 and blue eye Sunday and, and how Jesus, you know, they try to fig- make paintings of him like he's from France and this soft guy. And he said, you know, we, have our, we originate from France and I got blonde hair and blue eyes. I said, well, you'll, you'll be all right, get over it. So, <laughs> but... Uh, you say, should I have a painting of Jesus that not have a painting of Jesus with blonde hair, blue eyes? No, you shouldn't have any painting of Jesus. The Bible says, make no image of him. You, you violate the second commandment, right? Should I not have that image? Yeah, that, that's, that's what that's talking about. You don't want to have any image of him. So, uh, the, the church of Corinth was elevating godly men. They were, they were not elevating Christ. They were elevating men because they were, they were asking, like, who baptized you? Did Paul, Apollos, Cephas, or Christ? And they were, they were, they, they were focused on these man-made foundations. And, and that's what they were arguing about in chapter number one. And, and Paul says, you, you have all these divisions, uh, the, these schisms in your church. And, and it was because it was a man-focused, man-centered philosophies. Uh, and the best man-made foundations will crumble. They always crumble, but Christ's foundation will last forever. Some falsely taught, as I mentioned earlier, that, that Peter is the, the rock upon which the church is built. That, that he was the, uh, he was the, uh, you know, the apostolic generations that are, that are going all the way back to, to, to Peter and and uh, succession there, but Matthew 16, 18, when you read that from where the Catholic Church gets that from, it says, and I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And, and, and when you break that down, he says, thou art Peter. And the Greek word there is Petros, it's, it means a stone. He says, but upon this rock, which means a boulder, I will build my church. And it's a play on words. He says, like, Peter, you're a pebble, but upon this rock, I'm going to build the church. And the rock, you need to understand that Jesus is going to build it upon, was the confession that Peter declared, that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That that confession of Christ as the Son of God is the foundation upon which the church is built. Jesus is that foundation. It's not a man. Now Psalms 118.22 says, the stone which the builders refuse has become the head of the headstone of the corner. Uh, one thing, if you know anything about construction, you have to start with your foundation. 
And, and you don't start a foundation in the middle of the wall. It's, it's comical. The people who giggled realized that, that you just that would be silly. You always start in the corners. You, you start at your corner post. You get all the corners. Typically, you'll see them build up the corner like this, both corners, and then they run a line across, and then you lay those. But the corner piece, uh, the cornerstone, is the most essential because you've got to get those set. And you get all of that leveled out, and you run a string across, and you run a water level on there, and you make sure that's balanced, and then you can run a string and keep all the, everything straight from there. But it starts in the corners, and so it tells us, Jesus is that chief cornerstone. Isaiah 28, 16 tells us that. Matthew 21, 42. Peter affirms it in Acts 4. He says, This stone which is set at naught of you builders has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other. And he begins to preach Christ. Paul again affirms this in 1 Corinthians 3, 11. He says, For other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Uh, all through the Gospels, all through the Bible it, in Old Testament, it validates that Christ is that foundation. And, and in Ephesians 2.20, it says, that are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone. He is the foundation of stone. He is the cornerstone upon which all of the rest are laid. So Christ, and then you have the apostles and prophets and all of the rest that begin to be built on top of that. And we're God's building. The church is on top of that foundation stone. So faithfully, Paul preached Christ. He elevated Christ. And, and a church must lift up the Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to be a message that the world will deem foolish. They will see it. When I was lost, it wasn't acceptable to my ears. When you were lost, you, you weren't like, you know what, I really like hearing preaching like Pastor Josh gave on Sunday. I really want to hear about that. You don't want to hear about that. But when you're saved, it draws your soul into it, right? You don't want to hear preaching on meekness, biblical meekness, if you're lost. You're like, that's moronic. But when you understand the gospel, it shreds your pride and it brings humility and it grows your soul and, and faith and understanding. And so, so build as stewards, be faithful with God's word, build on the right foundation, which is Christ. And then thirdly, build with the right material, verse 12 through 17 lays that out. Uh, in building upon the foundation of Christ, the believer can build, uh, it says here, with two different types of material. Uh, you're very familiar with these, wood, hay, stubble. Uh, again, one thing you know about wood, hay, and stubble, uh, they are ordinary, they're inexpensive, they are cheap, uh, they are flammable. <laughs> you, you burn with them. Secondly, uh, you know, they had a you know those uh, grasses that grow up real big. I guess I just haven't had a lot of experience with them, um, and they can they get bigger every year. You know they get just keep going, and I know that stuff. But uh, every year I'm like, man, how do you get rid of all the dry stuff that's like this big, right? So I had a buddy at church. He said he said just take a match, man, throw that on there. He said it will burn up in 30 seconds. I mean it's just like he said, but you know you need to, <laughs> you just need to know like it's gonna be a flame. So like I'm sneaking out there, I'm like, how do you sneak out there in front of 5,000 cars that drive down this road and, you know, throw a match on there? It just happened to be like the windiest day in a month. <laughs> it's just flaming up. I'm like, I remember having a bonfire over behind the house and I had the cops coming in. They said, somebody set your house on fire. I said, no, we're just over here, you know, eating, having a little, eating s'mores, you know. They say, oh, okay, you can, you can have one too if you want. You ever heard about Jesus? Yeah. <laughs> Because them eternal flames, you know, I didn't get, in, I didn't get in like that. But so wood, hay, and stubble—they're flammable. And uh, and then third, secondly, you have the gold, silver, and precious stones. They're permanent material. They're they're beautiful. Uh, they're valuable. And and I think it's important to note that one difference between wood, hay, and stubble versus gold, silver, and precious stone. It's easy to get wood, hay, and stubble, but if you get gold, silver, precious stones, you labor for those. Wood, hay, and stubble lay on the ground. Gold, silver, and precious stone, you have to unearth them. There is effort in, involved. We live in a Christian generation that doesn't want to put the effort in, right? To, to, to mine out the valuable treasures. The first, uh, the, these materials represent, the first illustration speaks of those who need to grow in their faith. And it uses the Word of God as being what allows them to grow. It says, um, uh, it says the Word of God, they desire the sincere milk, sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. It says that, talks about that. 
And then um, the, the second illustration is that of farming and the seed that is planted that brings salvation is the word of God. So the word is what grows you in verse 1 through 3 and part of verse 4. 4 through 9a is the illustration of farming and the word of God is what is producing fruit. And so here are the materials that you're building with would then seem to be the Word of God as well. If it's the Word of God in the first and second illustration, you would, you would conclude that it would be contextually the Word of God as well here that you're building with. The Word then is food for growing, seed for the field, and material, material for building the temple that God has called us to. And so what would the wood, hay, and stubble represent? They represent both teaching and living that is grounded or not grounded on the Word of God. Uh, the Word of God, for those who build with wood, hay, and stubble, treat the Word of God carelessly. It is not dug into to pull out the vast treasures it possesses. Rather, it's not highly esteemed. Some churches have built churches of wood, hay, and stubble. They teach man's wisdom. They pull out a little bit of surface truth from God's Word mixed in. They don't dig deep into the Word of God and use the great doctrines of Scripture to build up the body. Rather, they treat the studying of the Word of God carelessly. I will say this. When you read the Scriptures and really study the Bible, what you'll find is Paul lays down just layers of doctrinal truth, layers of, of, of scriptural exhortation of what truth is. Like if you go to the book of Romans, he goes 11 chapters deep through 11 chapters, laying down doctrine, doctrine, doctrine. And then chapter 12, Therefore, my beloved brethren, it, then it goes into the practical application. What you'll find today is, and that's what he does in the book of Ephesians. Most people like to read Ephesians 4, 5, and 6. Not a whole lot of people like reading Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 all the time. And they're just loaded with doctrine. But he lays three chapters of doctrine down before he can get into the three chapters of duty. You have to have truth before you have application. But what churches do today so often, and we have to always guard against that, is where they just highlight application and they find surface truths from the Bible to tie into the worldly applications that they want. They want these things in their life, and let me find some wood, hay, and stubble to kind of, to kind of prop that up with. But the, the way that Bible preaching should be primarily done is where you read the Bible, you explain what it means, and then you show how you can apply that. Does that make sense? So, so there's two ways to preach. Like I could come up here and say, well, how can you have happiness? Let's have a thought there. How to really be happy and joy-filled in life. And then you could go and find, well, you know, the Bible says happy is the man to do with this. And, you know, I'm going to find some verses that kind of, kind of back up the message I want to preach. Or I can go to the, what the Bible preaches and study that out and say, this is what the Bible says, this is what it means by what it says, based upon the context, based upon the exposition of that, pulling and extracting it out, and this is how we can now apply that. This is how they applied that then, and this is how we can apply that now. So one is, it's a man-centered focus of how the message is birthed. The other is, the Word of God is producing the message. Does that make sense? That's why when you take two, three, four years and walk through like one of the Gospels, you're just going wherever the Gospel goes. So I'm going to the next passage in Matthew. The Bible's driving this church. The Bible's the leader. I have gone to verses where I'm like, I can tell you one time I preached in through the book of Genesis and I'm like, Jesus, I don't want to, I don't want to preach that part right there. There's a, there's a couple places where it's like, there's, you know, it was like when Jacob like uh, had a child with like his daughter-in-law. I mean, it's just one of those things it's like, yeah, I don't want to read. I don't even want to read it. I remember J. Vernon McGee, I was, I was reading some commentaries on it. He said, that is the worst chapter in the Bible. I'm like, I know! I know! Even McGee talks about it. He goes, I don't want to preach this. And I was like, Lord, let me just bypass it. And I can't, I can't, I can't. So I have to preach it. So I went through it. And, and it, was, it was like one of the most powerful sermons like for my own soul. And I think it was helpful for people. But it was such a, such a blessing to work through. But... That's what you have to do. Because you know what? There's some chapters in our life that we don't want to deal with. And as you walk through that, you have to confront that stuff, right? And so, and, and, and he talks about that. Sadly, sadly, people can not be grounded in the Word of God because they've not dug in and they get tossed around like Ephesians 4 says, 
And they follow false doctrine, the slight of men, cunning craftiness. And, and I tell you right now, because of YouTube, people can fall into all kinds of crazy stuff. <laughs> people send me videos, multiple videos every week, different people. And I can't stay up with all that. You know, watch this 57-minute video and tell me what you think. Like, give me four paragraphs. You know, I'm like, I can't have time to watch it. You know, give me I have better things to do. Now, if I have time, I'll kind of read through and skim through certain stuff. But... Uh, Anyway, don't send me a conspiracy thing about Jesus coming back in 30 days, okay? <laughs> now, what does the gold, silver, and precious stones represent here? Well, these represent the glorious truths of God, the doctrines of Scripture that have been pulled out of the Word of God. They're not like pulling out rubble. They're precious stones. I like what Warren Wiersbe said here, as I commented earlier. He said, you can find wood, hay, and stubble in your backyard, and it will not take much effort to pick it up. But if you want gold, silver, and jewels, you have to dig for them. Lazy preachers and Sunday school teachers will have much to answer for at the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show yourself approved unto God. Workmen that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The word rightly dividing is a construction word. It actually means cut it straight. Like, make it level. Make sure that it's precise, accurate. D.L. Moody used to say the converts should be weighed as well as counted. God is interested in quality as well as quantity. One missionary said the work will never go deeper than we've gone ourselves. And even as, even as men, I think we need to, to take account of that in our homes. Don't expect your families to go spiritually further than you. Now they may, but that shouldn't be the case. You should be leading from the front and when we, we then build with the right or the wrong material, if we faithfully build on the Word of God, it will direct our actions. It directs our thoughts, our attitudes, our motives. It, it, it's truth that comes in and then it's truth that comes out. It just does that work. And how will the two kind of material be discovered and who will examine the works? Well, when believers one day will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, Christ will discern between the two. And how will he discern worthy works from what we would call worthless works? Well, the Bible tells us in verse 13, look what it says. Every, man shall, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by what? Fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Now, you need to understand, this is where Catholics get the false teaching of purgatory. This is the only place they get it. There's no other place in the Apocrypha. There's nothing else. You need to know that. This is the only place. This isn't talking about people going up there to go through suffering, uh, and then they, through that suffering, that they could be purified so they can get to heaven. This is talking about people who either receive reward or lose reward. And so, fire here is the absolute righteousness of God, and and, and this is referred to in, in the Bible multiple places, but in Revelation, uh, as well as in the book of Daniel, the Bible describes the eyes of Christ being like a flame of fire. Revelation 1.14, it says, His head and hairs were white like wool, white as snow. His eyes were as a flame of fire. He's the one who searches the reins of the heart to give every man according to his works. Christ's eyes will penetrate through our deeds, expose the true nature of our works. Speaking of this judgment, Paul says in chapter 4, verse 5, he says, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsel of the heart, then every man shall have praise of God. So, so God will bring to light what's there. If you ever say, you know, I don't know if that person's doing that for the right reason or whatever, don't, don't be so worried about their motives, worry about our own motives. And, and realize that God will be the judge of those things. And again, notice the first three materials are flammable, the last three are not. If you, if you apply fire to wood, hay, and stubble, you get what happened to the, uh, at the house there, you know, this big flame, and thankfully nobody called the cops and was worried that the house was burning down. But they burn up very quickly. But if you put gold, silver, and precious stones in a fire, all that will do is burn off the impurities. It will make them even more beautiful. They are revealed to be the real thing. Their value is revealed in the fire. So on earth, God will put our faith through... And I think this is important. God, I believe now, puts our faith through fiery trials on the earth to prepare us for that day. 
So as we read, as we apply, he puts us through fiery trials because we're going to go through the fire of God when this life's over. So does your faith last? Is it, do you believe him in the trials? Do you, do you turn to him? Do you, trials validate our faith. It also um, gives us an opportunity to glorify God. It's, you know, and a lot of times we went out of the trial, but all the trial is, do, we don't need a relief of circumstance. We just need to, to know that this is another opportunity that I can glorify God. This is, this is His grace is sufficient for me. I, I, I think I need to change circumstance, but the problem is I need to change perspective. I need to realize God is working all things together for good. There's always a purpose in the pain for the believer. There's always a grander work. Nothing is ever um, done through our life that is difficult or tribulation of a sort that God doesn't use the very micro parts of that. I mean, He uses every little piece in some beneficial way. If we could see it from eternity's sake, we would say as Paul, I will rather therefore glory in my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And then fourthly, build with the reward in mind. I think sometimes people feel like this is a wrong motive, but God puts it out there, so I will. But Hebrews 11.6 says, um, very familiar verse, says, and we we focus usually on the first part of this, says, without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is a rewarder. And, And notice what it says there. You must believe that he is. You believe God who is whose head he is. But you also have to believe that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. God is a rewarder. He he rewards. He he likes to reward. He tells us in Matthew 6, 9, 10, 20, set up for yourself treasure in heaven. But listen to Revelation 22. This is at the end of the Bible. Jesus said this. Revelation 22, verse 12. He says, behold, I come quickly. And look what he says. And my reward is with me. To give to every man according to his faith. Is that what it says? You're saved by faith, but you're rewarded by your works. You're saved, and and, and your faith produces works, right? True faith, James 2 talks about that, right? You show me your faith, I'll show you my faith by my works. So so you can't detach that. Uh, We know works don't save us, but a true faith will work. Um, The Lord will reward us according to our works, he says. The Lord's coming to reward people. Uh, was one of Paul's greatest motivations. His, his desire is ours. We want to we hear the Lord say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Paul said in Philippians 3, 13 and 14, I count not myself to have apprehended. I've not yet arrived at this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto the things which are before I press toward the mark. There is a, there is a removal of focus of the past and a drive for the future. He's pressing toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ. And, and this judgment that, that he talks about here is known as the judgment seat of Christ. You may have heard the word Bema seat of Christ. And, and we get the word Bema because that's where that word comes from, the, the word judgment seat there. Um, and, and this is going to happen. Romans 14, 10 says this, um, but why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive, look what it says, the things done in his body. While you're there on the earth, living in that human body, you're going to be rewarded based on what you did as a steward of that body, that building, according to what you have done, whether it be good or bad. Now, what is the judgment seat of Christ? This is the judgment of the believer. Uh, Christians will stand before Christ in this and be judged. Each Christian will give an account to the Lord of what he or she has done since being a Christian. That's why when people say, when you get to heaven, will you remember who you were and will you know people there? You're going to be going over your life to Jesus. (laughs) The Bible tells us in heaven, uh, it says in in Hebrews 13, 8, I believe it is, to uh, submit to those that have the rule over you. He's talking about being, basically being a good person in the church. You know, don't, don't be rebellious toward the pastor. It says, because the pastor's going to give an account for you. Well, how could I give an account for people if I don't remember them, right? So over and over, there's so many places in the Bible that talk about how you'll know each other. But, but the believer will not be judged. You need to realize this. You won't be judged for your sins here. You'll be going to be judged for your service here. 
And we know that because Romans 8, 1 tells us there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. You're not going to be condemned. If you have sin, you would be condemned. So this is not a judgment of sin. This is a judgment of service. This judgment is called the bema seat. The word judgment in the Greek is the word, Greek word bema. And the word bema speaks about an elevated chair at the, uh, at the Olympic Games then. They had, the, uh, different, they had a couple different Olympic events in those times. The uh, Isthmian Games, the ancient Olympic Games as well. And, and they would have an elevated chair where there were judges, and, uh, and, and, and you would come before that place, and they would, after a race, either you receive the reward or you lost the reward because your performance wasn't good. So it was not a place where people suffered at. It was a place where you either received a reward or you lost a reward. That's, you just need to understand that that's what it's, it's referring to here. Uh, and so, um, when will the judgment seat of Christ take place? This is going to happen after the rapture of the church and before the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. How long will that be? Well, we know it's at least seven years because the 70th week of Daniel has to be fulfilled. And uh, it's probably, it could be quite a few years after that. We don't know how soon the tribulation starts after the rapture. It could, I think it will start probably within a year or so, but it could be a short amount, even shorter, longer. But, but it's going to start some point right after that. So we're going to be in heaven. The rapture of the church, this is, this is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 18. We're caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Uh, we know that that's not talking about the second coming of Christ, because when Jesus comes back, we come with him on white horses, and he comes to the earth to set his kingdom up on the earth. At the rapture of the church... There, it's also imminent, which means there's no signs leading up to it, but we're caught up together with them in the clouds to go to be with the Lord. So at the rapture, you're taken up and you go to heaven. At the second coming, he comes back to set his kingdom up on the earth. So during that, during that period, at least seven plus years, we'll be in heaven and, and there's going to be a judgment seat of Christ at that time. Uh, I got multiple reasons why that would be the case. According to Luke 14, 14, believers will be rewarded when they're resurrected, as the Bible says. Also, 1 Corinthians 4, 5, multiple other verses talk about the reward associated with that day, and that day is talking about here, it refers to that day. There's many other reasons. I don't want to dive into that, that deep tonight. But where will the judgment seat of Christ take place? Uh, it will take place in heaven. Uh, believers will be caught up to be with the Lord, 1 Thessalonians 4.17 says, this is also supported in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1 through 8, where Paul is describing events that take place when we're absent from the body and present with the Lord. He says, I long to be clothed upon uh, of that new man he's talking about in chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians. And so, who will be the judge? You need to understand, God the Father is not going to be your judge Uh, One day, Jesus Christ will be your judge. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, We must all appear before the judgment seat, it says, of Christ. And if you remember back to John chapter 5, verse 22, uh, Jesus says, The Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto who? The Son. You You know who's sitting on that great white throne judgment? That's Jesus Christ. Who the heaven and earth flee from His face. So, unbelievers will be judged at the Great white throne judgment, Revelation 20, verse 10 through 15 talks about, where believers will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. Um, the, the believers will be judged upon, not again, not whether they're saved or not, that's already been determined. Uh, it is not a judgment to judge believer for their sins. The Bible says our sins are cast away, they will not be for, remembered, they're forgotten. Uh, Psalms 103, 12 says that also. Hebrews 10, 17, their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Uh, what it is, is 2 Corinthians 5, 10. Let me read this verse and explain it. It says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And people can get confused because they think that's a moral bad. That's not a moral bad. What that's talking about is this. It could be translated, according to that he, which he hath done, whether it be worthy or unworthy. Good or worthless. Um, MacArthur says these Greek terms do not refer to moral good or moral evil. Matters of sin have been completely dealt with by the death of the Savior. Paul is comparing worthwhile, eternally valuable activities with useless ones. 
I think David Jeremiah gives us a good thought. He says, at the Bema Seat of Christ, earthly wreaths and trophies and newspaper clippings and Super Bowl rings will be long forgotten. They'll be no more important than brushing your teeth or buying a newspaper at the corner store. But what we do now for eternity, even the smallest deeds will count forever. Howard Hendricks gives great advice regarding rewards. He says, again, only two things last, the Word of God and people. It would only make sense to build your life around those things that last forever. A great way to live is to have what one man said, to have a Bema Seat mindset. A Bema Seat mindset. To think about everything in the lens of 1 Corinthians 10.31, whether I eat or drink, whatever I do, do all to the glory of God. Now, the result of this judgment is there will be a, it will be a time of celebration. You need to realize this is, this is kind of like a, um, a graduation party or a graduation. People, some people get great you know, rewards of their effort and some people just skim through. <laughs> you know, I wasn't the best high school student. College changed me, but high school was not, was not there for academics. Would have changed things if I could have gone back. Anyway, that's a regret. But here you'll find that it's a, it's a time of celebration. There will be people that will be sad that they didn't do more. There will be people that, that boy, if I could have gone back, and, and maybe they were successful on earth, but they didn't do anything for the Lord. But let me give you these five different, there's crowns that will be given, the Bible talks about, and I don't have time to, to read through all the passages of these. I just want to give maybe a brief thought on each one. But the, the Bible tells us that you will receive an incorruptible crown if you have mastery over the old man. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 29 talks about that you will receive that crown if you gain victory over that old man, if you live with a, a state of victory. For the, secondly, for leading others to Christ. 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 says... For what is our hope, our joy, and our crown of rejoicing are not even you in the presence of our Lord? For you are glory and our joy. Uh, The Bible says in Philippians 4, 1, Therefore, my beloved, dearly, uh, brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown. He's talking about they're going to be his crown uh, one day. Thirdly, for faithfully enduring trials. The Bible talks about you will receive a crown of life. Revelation 2, 10, Jesus told the faithful believers that Smyrna, he says, be faithful unto death. And he says, I'll give you a crown of life. The Bible talks about a crown of righteousness for loving Christ appearing. Second Timothy 4.8, it says, he shall give, uh, henceforth there is laid up a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but all of them that love his appearing. The Bible also talks about pastors who are faithful to flee, feed the flock of God, the word of God, will receive a crown of glory. And in 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4, he talks about feed the flock of God that are among you, and you feed them with the word of God. And verse 4, it says, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fainteth not away. And, and so being faithful. The Bible also talks about in Matthew five nineteen that anybody who teaches the word of God and doesn't live out those truths, but sets a bad example or teaches falsely, they will be called the least in the kingdom of God. But those who teach and live that out will be called great in the kingdom of God. And so why is receiving a crown or reward important? Uh, It has nothing to do with self-glory. Everything is about the glory of God. And you see this in Revelation 4, don't you? They they fell down before the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ, and what were they casting down? Their crowns. Uh, And so uh, I believe that uh, in the millennial kingdom, the rewards that you receive will determine the type of service that you will render to God during that time. Revelation 1.6 says, He made us kings and priests unto God. And we will, and, and to Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Revelation 3.21, To Him that overcometh, Jesus says, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and sat down with my Father in His throne. He says in chapter 5, verse 10, And has made us unto God kings and priests, and we shall reign where? On the earth. We're going to reign. Well, what's that mean? Well, well, when you read, you remember in Luke chapter 19, verse 17, he says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over very little. Have their authority over ten cities. And the second tier guy, he says, Be fa- You've been faithful over a little. Have authority over five cities. Uh, Paul said in t- 2 Timothy 2, 12, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. And so... I believe that there's going to be a sphere of, of, of reigning and ruling that God will place believers in His millennial kingdom based upon their faithfulness here. 
Listen, um, that's why people get so focused on the here and now and setting their kingdom up and doing all that. Listen, uh, all the things you see here are going to be burned up. God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth and, and live for the eternal. Don't live for what will be burned up. And it's not about you don't compare yourself to other people. I'm not the standard at Lighthouse. Jesus is. And so set yourself to him and say, you know what? How can I be fruitful, pastor? You know what fruit is? It's taking the truths of the Bible and living those truths out. It's what when you read in the Bible, you can begin to read in your life. That's fruit. So as you take in the Word of God, you begin to give it out by your life. And that's, that's really, uh, and you'll be fruitful. If you grow in this, you can't stop from being fruitful. Just like a, a, a tree branch could not stop bearing fruit if it's attached to a healthy vine. And so there will be some who will have their rewards lost. 2 John verse 8, listen to what it says. Look to yourselves that we lose, none, we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Colossians 2.18, let no man beguile or deceive you of your reward. Like over and over it talks about these kind of things in the Bible. So don't, don't get caught up in things that can cause you to lose your reward. The greatest consequence of unfaithful Christian living in this life will result in those believers standing before God ashamed. 1 John 2.28 says, And now, little children, abide in Him, that when He shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him in His coming. You know, imagine how terrible it would be if the Lord came back, the rapture happened, and you're in the middle of a bad, sinful situation. The last thing you ever remembered doing was a sinful thing. That would not be good. So... And again, I don't think you'll remember that in all of eternity, but I think that there, we need to live in expectation. Be ready to stand before God. Be faithful. And so tonight, examine your service. Examine your motives. Examine your purity. Let me, let me close out with a, maybe a couple minutes. I just want to... Who's familiar with Jonathan Edwards? You've, you've maybe read something of his. And Jonathan Edwards was 20 years old, and he made 70... And it started it when he was 20, but he began to write down resolutions, things he was resolved to do. Um, resolve just means to make a firm decision, and he began to write these out, and I read through these 70. I've read them before, but I, it, just, it just brings you into a good state of mind. I think it's important to step back in life and just say, what are my priorities? Like, what do I really want to accomplish? What do I, if those are the things I want to accomplish, if people in the Word of God are the lasting things, like, let me start living for that, right? So here's what Jonathan Edwards said when he was 20. He says, being sensible that I am unable to do anything without God's help, I do humbly, and if you're not familiar with Jonathan Edwards, I'll just say this, he was probably the greatest theologian in the United States of America's history. Brilliant man. He says, I, I do humbly entreat him by his grace to enable me to keep these resolutions so far as they are agreeable to his will for Christ's sake. Remember to read over these resolutions once a week. And so he would read his 70 resolutions every week. So I think maybe this will inspire somebody to do this, and maybe it would be helpful. He said first, and, 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 and again, I just picked a handful, maybe a dozen of these out. 70 would take us a while. But he says, first of all, his first one, he said, I resolve that I will do whatever I think to be most to the God's glory. Number two, resolved, if ever I shall fall and grow dull so as to neglect to keep any part of these resolutions to repent of all I can remember when I come to myself again. Thirdly, to resolve to live with all my might while I do live. Fourth, resolve never to do anything which I should be afraid to do if it were the last hour of my life. Listen to this one. Resolved, to act in all respects both speaking and doing as if nobody had been so vile as I, and as if I had committed the same sins, or had the same infirmities or failings as others, and that I will let the knowledge of their failings promote nothing but shame in myself, and prove only an occasion of my confessing my sins and misery to God. That blows me away. He says, if I ever see someone else sin, I will never think of them as worse than me. It will only bring me to the state of casting my eyes on my own sinfulness and bring myself to a place of humble repentance is what he's talking about. Is that amazing? How many 20-year-olds in the world have written that? 
He may be the only one in the history of the world. Resolved when I feel pain to think the pains of martyrdom and of hell. Resolved never to do anything out of revenge. Resolved never to speak evil of anyone. Resolved that I will live so as I shall wish I had done when I come to die. Resolved to study the scriptures so steadily, constantly, frequently as I may find and plainly perceive myself to grow in the knowledge of the same. Resolved never henceforth till I die to act as if any, any way my own, but entirely and altogether God's. I will live that I belong totally to God. Resolved after afflictions to inquire what I am the better for them. <laughs> but am I the better, uh, what am I the better for them and what I might have got by them? I mean, he just goes through, I mean, that's 12. He goes through 70 of these. No wonder, no wonder God used him so mightily. It, it, so many of these things, and I, and I tried to pick out some, that, you know, he wrote at such a high level. He was so really. He graduated college at like, I think at 13 and a half or 14 years old. I think he was like Princeton or Yale. I mean, he's just a brilliant guy. So um, this was, uh, I, I think in our life, we need, to, we need to start living in light of eternity, right? So we're thinking about, you know what, I'm going to stand before God one day. I need to live with that thought. If we can go a week without thinking about the judgment seat of Christ, there is a mispriority in our minds. We need to write down, I'm resolved to think about the judgment seat of Christ at least every week. Resolved to consider how I'm living. Will that line up with approval before God? Resolved that I will build gold, silver, precious stones and not wood, hay, and stubble. Resolved that if I have sin in my life, that I will cast it aside. Begin to write some things like, I'm resolved to do this. Resolve that I will not backslide and get out of church and get into some sin. Resolve that I will have an accountability partner. Resolve that I will stay in the Word of God. Resolve that if I, I mean, just, just make some resolutions. Or we can live for the flesh, right? We can live like the lost. Jesus says, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give to every man according to his works. He's coming and his reward's with him. In that moment, everything we do for Him is only going to be what matters. we got to live with that in mind. Amen? Let's all stand tonight. Heads bowed, eyes closed. and Maybe in your life as, you kind of, life, as you kind of examine your heart, maybe there's some things that could edify you, encourage you. I know it's been helpful for to me to just, just run my mind over these things throughout the day and just thinking, boy, I sure want to live with eternity in mind. I want to live to make a difference. And we don't create that difference. We just line our life up with God and He uses us for His glory. If you're here tonight and you say, Pastor, could you just remember me in prayer? I, I really want my life to be used for God in a way that would bring Him glory and that would, that would be what God wants me to do for eternity. And I really feel God moving in my heart. There are some things I feel I could do more for God or I feel like I need to make some adjustments. But if that's your heart's desire and, and, and God's pressed your heart tonight, would you just raise your hand that I might know to pray for you and scan across the room. Boy, I know my, my hands are with you. I feel the same, that press. God, Father, we just want to pause in your presence. You're, you're so good. And sometimes we get so nearsighted, so much to do. Help us to have eternity in mind. We're breathing. And as the days and years go by, our breathing becomes more shallow. Our days become less. The hours are nearing when you return. God, I pray that we would be faithful, that we would go into the fields. We can't win anyone to Christ, but we can spread seed and we can water the seed. And we know that you'll be faithful to bring the increase. I pray that you would be glorified in the, not only the listening, but the response of how we respond to these truths throughout the night and the day tomorrow. I pray some of us would even perhaps tonight and tomorrow and this week sit down and begin to write down some resolutions of how they would be resolved to follow you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need to make a spiritual decision tonight, if you need to be saved, if you need to make any decision, we can meet you in the front. You're welcome to come.
Church, as these pray, there's still time to make a decision if you need to. people said amen you may be seated and uh, for uh, if you have a prayer request you've written down if you just want to raise that up and these guys will come around while they're coming around uh, just a reminder this Sunday we're starting our new life group studies in Romans and Ephesians most of the adult classes will be jumping into a book of Ephesians a great study I love the book of Ephesians so if you'd like to jump into one of those do that Romans will be here in the sanctuary Ephesians will be in the other adult classes um uh, also, uh, uh, we're going to be having a safety team meeting after each service Sunday, and so uh, really could use some help with that if different people were breaking up some different teams to help with that. So if you could help with the safety team, uh, and, and basically that's, uh, there, there's a, there's a, just what it calls, safety, helping people with different things, and uh, just uh, in the services, if you have any background in, in the medical area, if you have just a heart to try to keep things safe and, and sound, and, and sometimes that's just helping direct people and, and kind of keeping an eye on things. Uh, if you can help with that, uh, we'll have a meeting after each one of the services. Uh, also, uh, as the church is growing, uh, we kind of ran out of parking uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, the week before Easter. And so... Um, uh, if you, we, we haven't had this problem since we were at one service, but um, we have a gravel parking lot in the back. I don't want, you know, I don't want anybody in high heels or a senior walking through with a cane or somebody that's not physically comfortable to do that, uh, to, to park back there. But if you're a younger guy and you don't mind to do that, that would help alleviate some of the pressure. So uh, the door that we'll have unlocked is over here. Uh, that we'll make accessible is by the nursery in the back door. There's a couple entrances, but that that that's the one we can't man. There's like seven entrances, so we just have the front and then the sides and then that that door. So we'll have that available to be uh, for people to come in. So uh, if anybody can help with that, that would be helpful, uh, especially that second service. So uh, let me share some of these prayer requests, and then we'll pray. And so uh, pray for the Pope family, a former neighbor and dear friend of the Jason Smith family. Jackie went home to be with the Lord, and so I want to have prayers and comfort and strength for that family, the Pope family there. Uh, thank you. And then Steve McKinnon, diagnosed with uh, dementia, uh, long road ahead, and that's Katie's, uh, Katie Fife's dad, so I want to pray for Steve. Pray for Jalen, uh, recurrent cardiac episodes, we'll have, have a cardiac ablation, so pray for that as that'll be coming up for Jalen, she's 13. Uh, pray for um, also Tammy. Uh, Slayton, lung cancer. Uh, this is Tim Dabe's um, aunt, and they're going to be starting treatment, so pray for Tammy. Pray for CAM College Finals next week, and so uh, no late phone calls, okay? No late phone calls. No, pray for CAM, doing good. We're proud of you. Pray for these, these college students. Pray for Rhonda Mendel, had appendix removed last night, went well. Pray for a speedy recovery and healing. And um, so, and then also Michael uh, this is Elizabeth's co-worker, Schulze, uh, just found out his dad is dying of cancer unexpected. So pray for a gentleman named Michael's uh, dad. Pray for, um, yeah, so that was a 
So let's uh, go ahead and break up in groups. If uh, you want to get in groups of two or three, find somebody around you. And uh, it's good to see Brian here tonight. Good to see you. And also, it's good to see a uh, new baby born over here. Yeah, Ray and Christian. Let's give these guys a hand. Little baby, first time here. And what's, what's the name? Kaysen? Yeah, little baby boy. And he was just born this last week. Yeah, Thursday, 14th. And so praise the Lord. Well, let's all stand. And... Uh, encourage you to break up and, and visit with somebody and then share some prayer requests, pray, and after that, uh, you'll be dismissed and look forward to seeing you Sunday. God bless.